All right, I'm just gonna wait a few moments as I see all the attendees coming in and then we'll get started shortly. Thank you, uh, Danielle. We're just commenting on, uh, on Jim's background, how, uh, how cool he looks and how uncool mm. we look. Uh, <laughs> I think Danielle still looks the best, actually, with the brick. Brick, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, Danielle. Yeah, I think there's a lot of you in here already, and people will still continue to flow in, come in. Um, but hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel today, A Lender's Guide to Payments, hosted by the Canadian Lenders Association. We have a really great group of panelists and a wonderful moderation uh, discussion moderated by Gary Schwartz, the president of the Canadian Lenders Association. So Gary's gonna take us through a panel discussion and then we will be accepting questions live as always. So feel free to submit questions throughout the discussion at any time and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And as always, this panel is being recorded and so it will be emailed out to all of you afterwards to rewatch it. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Gary, to kick it off, and I'll, I'll come on at the end to close things off. Thank, thanks so much, Danielle. That's great. Um, this is this is a really uh, amazing panel because we've spent a lot of time with 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 you um, in in building out resources and white papers around uh, the real time payment evolution uh, that's going on in Canada right now. And and I always say that the payment uh, is the flip side of of the lending coin, right? Um, and so this is a very uh, appropriate and uh, uh, timely conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to dub this, this panel, the need for speed, uh, <laughs> uh, sort of reflect back to uh, my, my days with electronic arts. But, uh, you know, I, we've been talking about speed and optimization uh, over the next little while. So maybe just, you know, to, to kick things off. Um, uh, if I could ask, you know, uh, Jim and Chris, uh, for you to introduce yourselves, um, a little bit about your background and, and, and really sort of how you fit um, into uh, the Rails conversation. Uh, may maybe start with uh, Jim. Uh, awesome. Hi, everyone. And, and Gary, thanks for uh, pulling this together. Looking forward to this, uh, this discussion. Uh, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. So I've been in payments uh, longer than I want to admit for, for a good chunk of my career. And most of my experience has been all around real-time payments and open banking over the last decade or so. And so because of that, I've been spending most of my time outside of Canada and in international markets like Australia, UK, et cetera, as those uh, markets have sort of moved a little quicker in the evolution of you know, RTP, real-time payments and, and open banking. I currently, I'm, I'm Canadian, I, I live in Toronto. I head up what, what Visa is calling our new payments flow business. And that's everything beyond the traditional card payments. So I spend most of my time thinking about money movement, fast money movement, global money movement, cross-border money movement, real-time payments and, and open banking and sort of how that all meshes together to see you know what, what the future of payments looks like. Spend a lot of time all, also with with blockchain and what does that mean now to our to our business? And so it's it's a very interesting space. Uh, it's definitely a space that everyone I think should dig into because it's going to have impact on everyone's business. If it's not already, it certainly is going to over the next couple of years. So it's it's time to start learning, leaning in and determining how uh, it could help your business and help your clients. So hopefully we'll get a, a few of those messages across today. We surely will, and 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 it's it's great that you have that global purview. So uh, we're going to go you know, we're going to wide, and then we're going to go deep. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Chris. Uh, maybe just a little bit of background on you to set the stage. Yeah, certainly, Gary. Thank you for having me and and Repay along. This is a, a discussion today. I've been in uh, payments in the financial services for roughly 20 years. I, I came into the space. <clears throat> Some of you will be too young to remember this. There was a thing called the Y2K bug that was going to end the world. And I came into the space about that time as a developer in financial services and just really never left financial services. Um, kind of transitioned out of a development role into a product role and into an operations and product role over the past 20 years. Uh, focused a lot in just overall payment and meeting customers and business expectations with the movement of money, right? We all know that, that that's the backbone of commerce. It's two sides of the transaction. Something's either bought, a good or a service, and then we all want to get paid for that good or service. And we've seen 
so much change in the past 20 years. I like to, to think about, you know, many of us still have a, 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 all of us still have a plastic card in our wallet that on the back of that card is a magnetic strip. And just to let you know how old that technology is, that's the same thing that many people have used to use in what was called an A-track. That was before cassette decks. Before CD players, before MP3, you know it. And some of that technology still exists. But if you look at what's happened in the past 10, 15 years, you know, kind of coincides with the invent of the mobile devices that have gone from just a cell phone in our pocket to a mobile device. We've seen technology take off that enables us to, to transact in a way that just wasn't feasible 15, even 20 years ago. So I've really spent my time focusing on looking what we can do to take payments and modernize those into a service that meets the customer where the customer needs it, whether that be a business customer, a client, or a customer on the end. And, and really focused on now and where the next few uh, years are going to take us is what are the payment modalities that people are expecting to use to pay? You know, the, the phone, the mobile device is great. What's next? How do we ride the existing rails? And what new rails are going to be available for us to ride to move those funds? So, um, it's been a great experience. I love what I do. You know, as I tell people, we all we all love seeing that money come into our account. So that's the quicker we can get it, the happier we make everybody. So that's a little bit about me and what I do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and 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 that sort of sets the stage nicely. I just I obviously clarify that you are the SVP of of right. uh, of product header product. Um, yeah, and so so we really have. Two of, of, of two sides of, of the, the industry uh, represented, uh, you know, we were head of new payments, fantastic. And then we have the deployment uh, on the product side. So, um, so to, to, to start um, and to set the stage, um, you know, why don't we go global? Um, it, it, and I'm going to point a little bit to Jim because uh, you, you, you talked about, you know, the, the, your peripatetic sort of business journey. Um, uh, you, you know, you have experience in other markets. Um, you know, it, Canada seems a little behind. I mean, we, we have um, quite a few uh, you know, countries globally that have, you know, faster payment systems, you know, in place for, for decades, really. And um, and I believe there there are forty countries right now that 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 have um, you know fast moving you know payment rails in place. Um, tell me a little bit about you know the, the sort of global picture, and then we can you know sit back and say, okay, what does this mean to Canada? Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. So real time payments are here. This is not a phenomenon that is coming. That you know that the 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 ship has left the yard, if if you, if that's the analogy. Uh, around the world, you're right. There is now, I, I believe, now 50 live okay. or about to be live. So that number continues to go. If we if we chat in a month from now, it'll be close to 60. So so that that's that's just happening. That's the reality. In some markets, though, there's been a, a variety of needs that dr that drove faster payments and that need quicker. Uh, you know, Australia is a good a good example of that where the need was really around moving money a little quicker, but, but also building some resiliency around uh, what they had in place currently. And, and so when you look at North America, North America is fairly well suited with some of the payment rails they have today and the ability to move money relatively quickly with what exists today. So I think that path of evolution to real-time payments is, has been a little slower to your point. In, in the UK, uh, if we we're going to point to the UK market, that was heavily driven by the need for the regulator to stimulate competition in the market. They actually felt that the banks in that market were not servicing the consumer well enough or the business well enough. So they wanted to drive and stimulate competition that would mm -hmm. then up the game of even the banks themselves. And mm -hmm. again, that environment you could argue one side or the other, but that argument in Canada doesn't quite hold. I don't think the, the government in Canada necessarily wants to stimulate competition to the point of disruption. And I think there's a bit of a balance there, partially because the Canadian consumer, for the most part, are fairly well served. And I'm using the word fairly well served, not completely mm -hmm. served. And there's always going to be room for improvement, but it's different in every market, right? And I, and I think... When I, when I think of Canada, so bringing it back home to the Canadian market and why 
we're getting there in the, in the Canadian market. There is a need for stimulating competition. There's a need for driving innovation. And, and that's absolutely important. And that's, I think, the drive of the real-time rail. And even some of the open banking conversations that we're having in Canada now is really about stimulating innovation to drive better services for, for the Canadian consumer. And so I think when, you know, when I look at what's happening in Canada, um, I think it's a fairly well-served market. I think there's existing rails, as, as Chris will talk about, you know, the services he provides. It really has nothing to do with, or, or at this point has nothing to do with Payments Canada's real-time rail, but the ability to move money instantly is available today through a variety of sources, mm -hmm. Visa being, being one of them and, and there's others. So there's no mm -hmm. need to wait, right? I mean, that, that, that service is, is available. So I think, I think what we're seeing in Canada and the pace at which the Canadian market is moving is I'd argue that we're moving to the 2.0 version of real-time payments and every other market that started earlier, Australia, UK specifically, are starting to also move to the 2.0 version. So we've somewhat leapfrogged 1.0 in Canada. Uh, you know, we could argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, the good news is it's coming. Um, and for the benefit of consumers and businesses, I think it's a good thing. Go. So, so to, to summarize, obviously, a lot of things happening globally. Um, uh, some, some are dictated by sort of local uh, regulatory pressure or uh, circumstances globally, but it, it, the, the general uh, trend is faster, 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 and uh, that's coming to Canada, you know, anytime soon. Um, uh, we're going to go back to that, that whole, the, 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 that, 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 uh, you know, um, sub sidebar conversation on, on, on stimulating uh, innovation. And, and competition because I think that's a that's an important one for this group because we're innovation we're innovation central at the Canadian Lenders Association so it's really important for us to to have everybody empowered uh, to to service Canadians but we're we'll going to get back to that um, Chris if I, if I could ask you um, maybe just explain to uh, you know people that are on this call what are sort of real time uh, you know, rails. What is it? Real time payment, and especially, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, Jim explained that there are lots of options that give you sort of, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat real time. So, what what are the rails, you know, through Payments Canada versus, you know, solutions that are in place like, you know, these direct and others? Can you just walk us through that so we just understand what we're talking about here? Absolutely. The the RTP acronym, Real Time Payments, carries so many different things to so many different people, depending on how you use it. And I try to break it down to when you think about real time payments and the ability to fund or push, which is a big difference in, in a lot of real time payments, the ability to push the funds to a recipient at the time they need them. And not only push those funds to the recipient has availability of those phones in real time, but also to reconcile the transaction. So it's really a, a two-sided coin here. One, the ability to push the funds to a recipient and they have those funds in a real-time manner, but also at that point, that transaction is reconciled. You know, many of our traditional banking systems still apply transactions in a temporary status during the day, wait for the night to post, and the next day you get your balance. And depending on certain institutions, you know, if you come in with a check over a certain amount, they're going to place a hold on that until it clears. It can be five or seven days. Um, in addition, you know, our traditional model of pulling funds, either through EFT um, transactions, either through card transactions, pools funds. Again, there's still a delay in that settlement and reconciliation piece. So when we think about real-time payments, we really are talking about the ability to push funds in a real-time manner and also be able to reconcile and settle those in a near real-time manner or real-time manner. We, we look at the, the product offerings as far as pushing those funds. Some of the biggest use cases we've seen so far is that ability, and I'll use, uh, use Visa here, is to push those funds out to those recipients when they need them. Think of an insurance situation where a disaster has happened and you may be in a situation where the, the local financial institutions are closed. However, those people needing assistance need those funds that may be supplied from the government or from the insurance companies. They need those in their accounts to make other accommodations. These new rails provide that perfect opportunity and use case to explain that an on-site insurance adjuster could literally assess the damage, help fund a check, help fund the necessary uh, coverage to ensure there's a hotel available, there's funds to cover a hotel. 
that can be done in real time without the need for the financial institution to be open for business, right? No need to go to another town, another institution. So all of that is part of the real time payments. And as we we focus on real time payments, especially for this audience, I think what's what's also crucial to think about is we're talking about it from that push payment acceptance. There's that whole back office reconciliation that is time to modernize as well, right? You know, this creates a new opportunity in the market to say, okay, we can push funds in real time. Now, how do we reconcile in real time? How can we do it quicker, faster, and and, and do those things in a manner that may require right. less resources? So it's not it's not fragmented, right? Because right. it's it's it, everything happens for all stakeholders in real time. So it's reconciliation right. in real time. Right. And I also think there's a little bit of what I would call um, hocus pocus magic on some of the real time perceptions. Um, and this isn't a negative. I think it's just the way they were built off the of technologies. A lot of times you'll see a consumer experience driven by what appears to be a real time payment. Um, you know, take some of these traditional services in a P2P space where I can pay you twenty five dollars. You bought my dinner last night. and It appears I paid you in real time. But as you as a recipient of those funds, if you choose to hold them in that particular service, you do have access to real time. But if you wanted to move those funds to your to your banking account, you may notice a three to five lag. So that is an example of where a real time payment experience, air quotes here, has been applied to the customer to move funds. But to the financial institution, it's still one of those previous methods they've been using. So, again, right. all of that means real time yeah. payments in this so, crazy so- world we're living right now. So just so I understand that, the way that I interpret that law statement is that if it's in the white picket fence of, you know, uh, let's say Apple, or it's like it's a white picket fence of, you know, Facebook, or whatever, then it's real time because they are controlling the moving pieces, almost like a pseudo uh, uh, real time rails. Uh, but right. if, if, it, if, if, it, if you need to be institution agnostic, then every every stakeholder has to be on on with the same business logic, Correct. and therefore you have to have ubiquitous um, uh, real time payment rails, and that's what we're talking about here. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. Good. Yeah. Good. No, well, maybe Gary, I'll just I'll make a plug a plug for for Visa Direct only because it just feels like the right time to do it. I mean, Chris, it's, Chris it's brought it a up, good time. right? Go for it. It's, it's a good look. So, you know, at, the, at the end of the day, it's an illustration of what we're talking about. So it's absolutely appropriate. Yeah. And, and the, you know, there's like, uh, like we said, there's options. There's, there's availability, there's options. But, but something that Chris sort of mentioned, when you think of something that like Visa being a global network, right, we're available 24-7. As you all, all know, card payments are available 24-7. Right. We reach in 180 different countries. We reach 5 billion bank accounts to be able to disperse funds to in, in real time. So right. when you bring it back to Canada, you know, the Canadian market in real time, you can disperse up to 90% of the bank accounts, I think is, is what it's at. Mm-hmm. And those funds, to, to Chris's point, are immediately available in the bank account and immediately available for the recipient to use those funds and spend them as they see fit. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's the key difference is, you know, to Chris's point around some experiences are the funds seem to move because the numbers show up, but then the use of those funds are not available. And that, that, like, then that is really, at the end of the day, not real-time payments, because the reason the recipient is asking or requesting the funds is in order to use them in some way, right? Right, um, right. And, and so Visa as a network and other networks that provide similar type solutions, the mm-hmm. key is immediate movement of the money, immediate avail- availability of the money, and immediate ability to use the money as, as you see fit. Right, so fungible. So, so, so um, you know, so you have Visa, Visa solution, and and I, I believe that Visa directed uh, five billion uh, transactions last year um, on, on the rails uh, in, in I think the U- U.S. alone. I mean, huge volume, and uh, and I was just looking at the clearinghouse, um, you know, quarterly activity in in the U.S. and look something like that, you know, uh, you know, uh, and, and I, I can use this without you actually seeing it because it's a trend, <laughs> you know, it's growth, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, it, 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 there's huge adoption, um, uh, which is, which is fantastic. And you've got Visa, you've got MasterCard Sand, you've got, uh, you know, uh, Interact e- e-transfer as well. So there are other solutions that are sort of riding, you know, the, the, the these faster rails. Um, yeah. So why, why the need for speed? 
like why you know you, you, the analogy you know Chris you brought up was hey uh, you, you know that 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 swipe uh, you know is the same technology as uh, an eight track player I kind of remember what an eight track player <laughs> was um, but we don't use it anymore you know uh, I can tell you that and 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 it went through a whole bunch of you know analogous to you know the music industry it went through a whole bunch of um, uh, technologies, each one allowed for faster, more volume, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a better, better solution, more veracity. And, and, and here we have, you know, streaming services and streaming services are getting faster and, and, and more robust. So in, in that context, um, you know, is the need for, for speed and, and there's just another evolution in the journey of payment you know, uh, cash has changed, uh, checks have changed, um, you know, payment uh, rails have changed. Is this just another step in an onward going sort of journey that we're going through um, in, in, in our, in the evolution of, of, of money movement? I, I view it as, it is just that. Speed is also equaling convenience nowadays, right? You know, we, we, we used to have to, again, going back, take a check down the bank and deposit it. We, we had to do things that required us to go and get cash uh, from a certain way of getting it, whether you went to a, an automated teller machine, whether you went to a bank teller, whether you had to go get a loan to make for something. It involved you leave, leaving your place in line, so to speak, and going to get that cash. Well, with these, with these methods of using real-time payments, uh, we, we – take the convenience to the customer or to the business in a way that allows them to continue what they're doing on their schedules. And we've also broken down or begin to break down what's feasible to do outside of normal bank hours, the old nine to five with it being closed 12 to one. We're allowing people to, to do things on their time and their schedule because not two people, not two people are going to have the same schedule. Most likely, you know, mm. who knows what that life involves as their life evolves, when they need the funds and how they need to be able to pay for goods and services. And so as we think about speed, speed is definitely part of the equation, but speed is also bringing the convenience to people to be, to be able to transact on their time. And so when you when you think about this, and that, that also offers a new level of security, I think. I see we have a question here regarding push payments, and I'll kind of address it here. Is, well, traditionally, we're a society, at least in the in the Americas, where we pool funds. That's kind of been the traditional way of doing things, and that's associated with higher chargebacks because we always have some bad players who want to get into it. We have it, opportunities for non-sufficient funds on paper checks. So there's there's things that do that. With push payments, we're really talking about the person saying, I have an obligation to pay. I'm going to push those funds out of my account. You can't push the funds out of your checking account if you don't have the funds. It won't work like that. So again, what does that mean? It allows me to make that payment when I want to, whether it's two in the morning, it's going to be there at two in some seconds afterwards, because A, it's real time. It's going to get where it's going and it's going to settle in real time. So I think, you know, speed equals convenience for the consumers and for the business uh, clients, it's it's the same thing. You know, we used to think about the old terms two two ten net thirty. Most of you won't remember that. It was why did we do that? It was the the business wanted to receive their funds as quick as possible. We're actually incenting incenting people to do that. Well, through this mechanism uh, of real time payments, we can do the same type of concept, but through an electronic means that will also help facilitate balance and reconciliation inside the ERP. So. Not only do I think about speed, which is crucial, and that's where the players, you know, such as, as Jim and Visa have stepped in and the opportunities that this market brings, it's the convenience. It's really what's driving a lot of this payment adoption. You know, it's just not the speed. It's the convenience that it brings with that. And I think the two of them can't be separated. I think the two work together, and that's why we're seeing such a driving success in real-time payments, uh, especially in the disbursement models. Right, yeah, right. And then – it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go I, ahead. I was just going to add. I mean, because Chris touched on it. it. It's speed, but it's also the on-demand nature of the payment. Right? It's the Saturday when you actually need to conduct a business, and you don't have to wait for it to hit your account on Monday, mm -hmm. which it does today. Right? It's it's the ability to move money on demand immediately. And the reality mm -hmm. is, I think we could all appreciate we are an on-demand society mm -hmm. today. Right? I mean, you just expect things to work. You don't order a movie to rent so that you could watch it on Monday, <laughs> on Saturday. It's just not how things work. So, you know, I, I think there's different rails, different speeds, 
different needs based on the use case. But what mm -hmm. we're starting to see is more and more use cases and consumer expectation, business expectations moving to faster. And, and I think there's some that absolutely need that speed. I, I think of collections, the ability for an agent to be on the phone with someone collecting money for the person on the other end to say, well, you know, the old, the check is in the mail, or mm -hmm. I will, I will go into my bank later and send it, or I'll send you an e-transfer, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that ability to collect a card credential and make that immediate payment while the individual is still on the phone and mm -hmm. knowing that it's there. Those are the types of real-time experiences where the movement of money, fast movement of money have direct implications to the user experience, both for the business and the consumer on either end. Right, right. And, and you, we don't even know what the use cases will be moving forward, because once you have yeah. rails, you have innovation on innovation, you have solutioning. And that's why we're going to get back to the whole fin fintech thing. Stay tuned. But before I get there, um, uh, obviously, COVID drove volumes up. You know, we just did a survey with the CLA um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to link, uh, it just look in the uh, chat window, but um, there's a link to a white paper that we did on, on real-time uh, payments, um, which is a great read. Um, and uh, I really encourage you to download that and read it off to this panel. And, and, and some of these stats that we, we pulled into that white paper based on, on pandemic sort of, you know, um, uh, increase in volume during the pandemic. So online transfer was up by 48%. Uh, digital payments, um, you know, uh, is now, you know, 79% of all transactions. 43% uh, of Canadians uh, have, you know, changed their payment preferences uh, to digital and contactless. Those are all things that, you know, you, you, you see, um, you know, uh, based on trend reports. Um, and vo volume is up, and, and, and this is ACH. Right, which ACH, as we know, is uh, it's also called direct uh, payments, um, which are kind of indirect because it's three to five days, right? So, um, so, so you know, when you talk about convenience, it's obviously you're facilitating that kind of increase in volume and demand, right? Uh, so, you know, where where do you see this surge in demand? Do you see it being satisfied by the, the current rails and and do you do do you, do you see a two speed economy where you have some folk using uh, the R, the the RTP and, and some people using uh, ACH or, or do you just see it's just a stepping stone as we talked about before towards the inevitables of real time you know economy? I'll start uh, and, and yeah, you, please. If you want to chime in as I speak, I think I think you're going to see any and all for a little while and I, I take the analogy to I would have told you when we would be through writing checks at some point but we're still just as heavy writing checks in, in the marketplace so I think it's going to vary off the use cases especially with real-time payments in a way now where it's, it's heavily focused on push payments that that's a great use case but there are going to be other use cases where it may not be the best option to, to do um, it's, you know businesses are are now coming more and more into ACH-based payments, and I think they will begin that transition over from check to ACH to RTP in the future. So, unfortunately, I think for us in the in the industry, it's you have to focus on all of them based off the use cases. Um, I do think adoption is going to drive where, especially in the generational uh, ages, you're going to see generational. Um, shift towards a particular preference and then whatever technology has been built by the market around that particular rail, right? I think that's why we saw the likes of the PayPal, the Venmo's, the P2P take off so quick is because A, the generational uh, younger people started using that as a form to pay and so that became their norm and as they, as they grow through their stages of life, they're going to have those expectations to be able to do that, which will be on that one. However, someone on the, on the older side well, let's say more mature side sometimes, um, they may not want to change their preferences, their, their preferences for a few years or, or ever. So I think we're going to see this, this shift into, you know, using a little bit of all. I think what's going to probably most likely happen is that diagram that you had for ACH. We're going to see other payment modalities kind of reach a point where, A, the growth is slowly, slowly starting to slow. And you may in some cases even begin to see a, 
a shift downwards in paying for cash, for example. And ACH and EFT may flatten and RTP may have a hockey stick the next three curve. But in the end of it, at least for, I'd say, the next 10, 20 years, we're going to have to focus on all three because all three of them are different use cases. Um, this is where I think the greatest technology opportunities are is who can provide the solution to meet all use cases. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with focusing on a single use case. The, the TAM is there for a single use case. But if you look across the total addressable market for all of them, that's even a bigger picture. I think that's where the opportunities are going to present itself for a whole bunch of fintech players to step in here and work on the rails, both existing new rails. And then, as we just mentioned, we don't know what's coming next. But that's that's kind of how I envision where we'll be in the next 10 years with these with these different types of payment right. rails. Right. Yeah. It, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was only going to comment around, you know, the digital engagement across all demographics. COVID certainly stimulated that. We, we think on average somewhere between four to five years was moved up of, of engagement on digital uh, because of specifically because of COVID and all age categories, all demographics got deeper in their engagement. So whether they were never engaged on digital, they started to get just slightly engaged, right? They made the odd online purchase. Those that were always online made even more. And, and so everyone just shifted a little towards more and more digital engagement. The analogy that I use is you know, my, my, my dad's in a, in a retirement home. Before COVID, there was no you know, online purchases. I go visit them now and there's a table set up in the hallway with all of their Amazon purchases, <laughs> right? And so, so that market is there as well. And, and so I think digital engagement has has uh, increased across across all demographics, and of course, Chris, as Chris said, the you know, younger people are just even that much more engaged. When we look at our numbers at Visa, a couple of things. So we're growing our real time rail payments are growing at exceeding eighty percent domestically. We're sort of in that two hundred percent, specifically around lending solutions and disbursement. So it's a massive growth. It is mm -hmm. moving that way. So we're pretty excited about that kind of growth. Um, but when you look at even post pandemic, what we started to see is the return of face to face type spending. And even though during the pandemic, card not present online purchases, and digital purchases were, were elevated, those growth rates on digital purchases have remained elevated, even though face to face is returning. So what you're starting to see is just by nature, more and more people are moving online and it's not coming back. So it's a, it's, a, it's absolutely a change that has happened because of COVID. And you think of the different ways people are buying now, click to collect, curbside pickup, ordering ahead, right? Mm -hmm. we, we all order our Tim Hortons coffee. There's probably a large percentage of us and now order it on the app and pick it up versus walking in the store. And so that sure. change alone is driving, um, you know, generational change and that on-demand uh, marketplace. Right. I mean, if you go to uh, Bell Fiber, you don't go back to uh, AOL dial-up, you know, so uh, so as things evolve, uh, solutions evolve, and, and obviously, you're not, you're not going back. It's muscle memory, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, the consumer has muscle memory, and, and that's how they, they're willing to interact. Um, so benefits. We, we see lots of value here, I'm, I'm hearing. Um, uh, speed, 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 get that end-to-end um, -end communication. Uh, you, you know, you, you touch on that, Chris. Uh, you've got instant payment confirmation. So the whole ecosystem is wired. Um, and that plays into, you know, as I understand now, this whole idea of, uh, you know, in, improving the workflow, right? Because everybody is, you know, you can forecast, you can plan ahead because you're seeing things. Like, there's no delay on how you see the, the consumer uh, receives money, but also the merchant uh, or, or the business owner is seeing the money flow in reconciliation, correct? So really it's a win-win for the whole ecosystem. Uh, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, yeah. yes, you I are. Mean, right. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, you know, one of the biggest problems right now with businesses today is, is cash flow, whether it's, whether it's meeting, meeting cash flow needs, um, whether it's making payroll or not making payroll, right? these, are, these are the differences in whether a supplier invoices do, but you haven't actually received the payment on the other end. So moving money faster provides a lot more security around where, where's my cash flow position and how do I manage it going forward? And so just you know, speaking maybe to this audience as, as lenders, 
you know, a key focus of lending right now is with the small business, not just consumer. Uh, mm -hmm. Small businesses need need funds. They need to be able to make funds available and have funds available in real time in order to keep their businesses afloat. And, you know, many times they're making that call and that decision with very limited time left on when their business is either going to defunct or not. And moving and waiting a couple of days is just not an option for these businesses. And I think these types of solutions deliver the much, much needed value to, to small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy. Let's remember that, um, mm -hmm. that, that we need to be able to deliver as an ecosystem. We need to be able to deliver it across the board and whether the banks are satisfying that need or whether it's new entrants and new innovators, uh, we, we just need to be a part of that solution collectively. Got it. And so we, we asked lenders, we are lenders, uh, the Canadian Lenders Association, and we sort of asked our lenders, you know, what, what, what is most important? And, and the, the top picks, um, you know, were uh, in, in our surveys were avoiding, uh, you know, uh, non-sufficient uh, non funds, uh, lowering transaction costs, ease of setup, ability to control the experience, instant status report on payment, check, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Those are all things that, that this is facilitating. Um, I'm going to now get to lenders and, and we have lenders uh, who are part of the CLA um, who are big banks and we have lenders who are mid-market and we have lenders, you know, who are in the alternative space. We have all shapes and sizes answering all the needs of Canadians. Like, you know, if there's an opportunity, we innovate, we come up with a solution and we execute um, as, as a community and that benefits Canadians. So let's go back to the real-time rails. And, and I, I know that maybe uh, so this question, you, you, you may not be able to answer as, as Visa or as, as, as Repay, but just generally, if you could, you know, look at, at what the trends um, and specifically to Canada. So the UK thought of, of the rails as a way of stimulating competition and innovation. Uh, Canada, we've thrown it in there. And, and my understanding is that only deposit taking FIs um, you know, uh, can be sponsored by, by Payment Canada. So uh, where does that leave the opportunity for the rest of the ecosystem that, that provides lending solutions uh, to use the rails to innovate and come up with use cases that we're not discussing here? Because that's the whole beauty of, of Foster and Better is that it facilitates things we can't even imagine. So I don't know if you can touch on that and I'm not asking you to represent you know, the, the, um, your companies, but just generally, if you could talk to where you think Canada is trending as far as servicing uh, the needs of, of fintechs. Yeah, so, so I'll, maybe I'll touch on it from Visa's perspective and I'll touch on it and, you know, what I think the Canadian market will start to see, right? At, at Visa, we're, we couldn't be more excited about our partnerships with fintech and the ability to drive innovation, right? We're a network. We don't necessarily pick sides. We're here to just ensure that people that can and want to deliver innovative solutions to their, their group of, of clients, they, they have availability to do so through our network. That, that's kind of our role. I mean, Repay and, and Chris is a really good example of fantastic innovators that are leveraging the Visa rail, leveraging other rails in order to ultimately deliver that solution. You know, frankly, we want more Repays or we want Repay mm -hmm. to be as successful as possible, right? Because the, the more organizations like Repay, the more the movement of money becomes better, the, the better solutions available to Canadian consumers. And ultimately, mm. everyone wins, especially the Canadian consumer and Canadian businesses. And that's, that's really our role as a network. Um, so we encourage fintech folks on the call, re reach out to Visa. We think there's all kinds of great opportunities to participate as part of the Visa network. In Canada, more generally, though, I'd say the government has, has certainly made a push to expand participation in Canada's payment rails, specifically those run by Payments Canada, including real-time payments rail going forward. There is a, a, a legislation on, on RPAA, Retail Payments Activities Act, which will put some rigor and, and regulatory oversight over fintech in Canada, but that's certainly not enough, right? Because that just puts an added regulatory burden on everyone, but yet doesn't actually expand participation. The Payments Canada Act is currently being looked at by Payments Canada, by government, by the Minister of Finance to figure out what is that risk-based 
um, appetite and, and access into rails, whether that's being sponsored into a rail similar to the visa model or whether that's direct uh, membership in some way through a payment service provider or something along those lines. Um, I, I think inevitably expanded participation is going to happen um, and it's going to be beyond the existing participation that is today. Uh, so I, I'm excited about that. I think over the next year and a half to two years, that will start to unfold with our PAA and changes to the Canadian Payments Act. Now, with that being said, I think Chris can attest to the availability and the options are completely available now, right? Chris has got a great business in repay. They are the innovators in this space driving real-time payments today, not, mm -hmm. not tomorrow. They have these solutions. They're robust, available, proven in the market to deliver value immediately. So, so I, I would just say, be con conscious of what's actually available to you today as innovators, because there is a lot already there. And in many cases, it might be just the right uh, rail or the right availability of a solution to help you deliver exactly what it is you want to deliver today. Chris, I mean, you, you probably can speak to that yeah, better. I would add, I, I think there's a great opportunity as we begin seeing, you know, and some people will kind of laugh at the statement, some regulatory uh, uh, pressure put around these or more, or more regulatory oversight, because that's not a negative thing. If you look at it, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for, for us in the fintech space to say, okay, how do we solve this problem in an efficient manner? How, what, what additional complementary services can we build on top of these payment networks? You know, shopping carts are a great example. They were built on top of the traditional payments, but, you know, that's what they do. They add complementary services to collect goods inside your virtual shopping cart to facilitate a checkout experience. So as we see these new and, you know, newer payment rails and the existing payment rails that are in place today continue to expand. I think you have to focus on what are the complementary services you build on top of these, especially these newer, these newer facilitation of real-time payments. And there, there are things that we know we want to do. There are unknown use cases that we haven't come across yet. And there's going to be opportunities, you know, especially for those first to market to do everything from offer the new services to even set the, you know, set the standard or what the, the price and the value will be of that in the market. So it really is kind of that open green space to, to use these new options, not to just say we're, we're there with supporting it, but what complementary services can you build on top of that? That I always like to think about what do I create that a customer didn't ask for, but now the customer can't live without, you know, and I think that's a great, a great way to think about it is we don't hear people beating down the door to ask for this, but now that we've done it and we've offered it and there's adoption, it, there's no taking it back. And, you know, the best thing I can equate to is the iPhone. Can you imagine they, you know, the, the Apple did a great job of changing the experience on a, a mobile device or a cell phone. Can you imagine not having an app store or anything, the same type of, of entrepreneurial thinking and the green space is where you have to focus to say, okay, we've got these great new opportunities uh, to facilitate money exchange. Okay, that's part of the experience. What can we do to really enhance that experience, especially in the loan loan space? I think you know, there's the biggest thing we've seen in loans, kind of as a, as another benefit is we've seen the ability to not only disperse via Visa Direct a a loan disbursement. Well. Many people now have the same form of payment they're going to use to retake that loan payment back. So in a single disbursement transaction, they've also been able to securely tokenize a, a, a debit card number, store that for the customer if the customer so chooses, and now they have a method of repayment. And guess what? That's a cycle. That happens over and over. You know, I paid it back, I need to borrow again, pay it. And now you've got a customer for life, and you've got a convenience factor built into the solution you're providing. Right, right, and 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 no, yeah. and, and you're right. I mean, in a, in our in our recent survey, we found out that 52 percent of lenders created their own LMSs to speed up the loan process, and that's an example of building around the rails in order to facilitate faster uh, service to to borrowers. So, uh, case in point. Um, but you know, ninety six point four percent used uh, EFTs to collect funds, and and I guess that's what's going to change, um, you know, uh, over the next uh, short time. And, uh, and, and, you know, our goal 
like yours is is just to make sure that uh, Canada is streamlined for innovation. And so, you know, uh, you know, this was our um, uh, our recommendation on the the pre budget consultation. Just so everybody knows, I mean, we 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 believe the the the, the you know accessibility is important. So just as we talk about open data. Um, Open accessibility to services allows for innovation. But as you rightly say, it's a component of a larger story that you're building and uh, it's accessible right now, uh, you know, through um, providers like uh, Repay. So thank, thank you for that. Let's move on, unless there's something, let's move on to risk. So faster, great, um, riskier, maybe right so uh, what what are the things that we need to put in place what risk strategies that we need to put in place to accommodate speed i, I know that the cla has launched lenders api which is a real-time data consortium to try and share uh, data anonymously to 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 allow people to make decisions in in real time on on you know data that there's not not visible um, in in the usual economy um, what what do you say to to risk based on the evolving payment rails? Yep. So when, when we launched our products <clears throat> into the, the disbursement space, one of the things that we had to really do was focus on not just saying apply our existing policies to this new to this new payment rail. Right. It did take us to examine <clears throat> and step back and look at where all the opportunities for let's just say fraud or for risk could occur in this new payment uh, stream. And so we had to apply a, a new way of thinking. So okay, this is a little different than we've done in the past and it's not just a copy and paste. It really is starting from scratch and understanding where those vulnerabilities may be or risk may be in this new value stream we're adding and setting the appropriate thresholds, approvals, monitoring, reporting as we looked at rolling these out to the market, you know, for example, and not only did that impact policy, which is, is part of it, it also involved the technology needed to apply the new policy or these policies in place on top of our technology. Because the key thing there was this had to be done in real time. There was nothing that, hey, a fraud alert came in Saturday night, let's check it on Monday, we get into the office. We with these with these real time payment systems going out, we had to be able to facilitate technology and decisioning in a manner that complemented the the um, the the real-time payment and not slow it down, but at the same time ensure we had protocols and technology in place to not allow fraudulent transactions or fraudster enter into the payment network. So when I think about that, that's one of the key areas to think about. It's not a copy and paste of your current risk policies. It is kind of looking at things differently and understanding that you, you know, you're now at a 24 by 7, 365. All funds are moving. All funds are available, right? There's not calling mm -hmm. the bank on Monday morning saying, put a hold on that. That was a, a bad transaction. You know, so much can happen in the course of a single day or a single hour now with the movement of funds like that. So, you know, my overall you know, suggestion is don't try to copy what you have for this and think you're safe. It, 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 you could be, I, I'm not saying it's not, but you really have to examine your policies and where you think you have the most risk and exposure from, you know, whatever you're putting up is if it's your capital, if it's your IP, if it's your data, if it's your customer's data, you have to look at all those and understand what new risks are being brought up forth. But more importantly, how do we mitigate the risk? Because I don't think you can simply say, well, we're not going to do this because of the risk. It's about mediating those risks and the proper processes, technologies, and people to, to put in place. Right, right. And apropos that, um, you know, following this uh, panel, we have an internal um, uh, risk office uh, panel, uh, we call it a roundtable, where, you know, we, we discuss, you know, the, the uh, evolution of, uh, of risk in our space. And, and this is probably a conversation that we're going to carry over. <laughs> uh, it's an ongoing uh, discussion. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we, we're coming to the witching, uh, the, the top of the hour, and I, I wanted to make sure we let, leave room uh, to, you know, what I call read the tea leaves, you know, what, what's going to happen over the next two or three years. And I know that we, we've talked about that a little bit in this discussion, but, um, 
but you know things that haven't come up although you alluded to it like blockchain um decentralized uh, payment networks things like that wh where where are we going from here is there uh, a uh, sort of you know what, what we, is there another step that we're looking at um are there parallel trajectories um on the rails that that we should be aware of um um and you know we can touch on blockchain we can touch on anything really um i i throw it to you to give us a, a portal into uh, the future uh, for our lenders and and other guests. Yep. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, go ahead, Jim. Um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, you know, the reality is, I think what you're going to start to see is more and more options, more and more options of rails, and then more and more options of providers that are leveraging those rails to deliver on a use case that makes sense for the market. Right, innovators. The one thing innovators do incredibly well is identify those places of friction and go attack them. And when you think of where there is friction today, money movement is a key area that, that friction exists, including cross-border. I'd argue cross-border is probably where a lot of attention will be spent. And it's where a lot of, a lot of time where we're spending attention around how do you send cross-border more efficiently? But, but that, doesn't, that doesn't remove domestic you know, payments being, being attacked as well and, and looked at in a new way. I think if you think of blockchain, I think blockchain you primarily will be cross-border type payments where they'll affect and, and typically large supplier-based payments, million dollar plus, there's trillions of dollars already being used for payments via blockchain uh, today, cross-border. It, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually impacting SWIFT to a certain degree because a lot of wire payments are moving to, to blockchain. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know whether we'll, we'll need to get into that as much, but what I do think we'll start to see in the Canadian market is one more options and two, a, a vast majority of FinTech who will start to enter the Canadian market over the next two to five years as our Canadian market becomes more receptive to FinTech operating in our market. And I think mm -hmm. there's an appetite across all stakeholders, government, and even banks themselves in partnerships with FinTech and I think you'll start to see that start to evolve. And we have such a rich fintech community in Canada. And if you look at some of the top fintech players in Canada, they're actually operating in other markets and not operating in Canada because of the environment of which we've created. And, and I think collectively as an ecosystem government, I think everyone has to be involved around how do we improve that situation? Because there's value that Canadians can provide Canadians uh, in, in the fintech world. And so I think what we're going to see over the next um, two to five years and, and hopefully sooner is a lot more availability of options to the Canadian consumer and the Canadian businesses that really hit the needs that they have. And I think, Chris, you mentioned meeting the client where the client is. I, I think there's all kinds of opportunity for innovators to do that today because arguably in the Canadian market, those needs are not necessarily being met to the effectiveness that they can be met. And, and, and if I could just hold that thought for a second, then uh, what, what are the two, if you would say two things that could happen to, uh, to encourage those fintechs to open up, uh, you know, uh, more aggressive business in Canada. It, it's, it's, it's not only obviously servicing the customer, but allowing you know, those businesses to operate as they would be accustomed to operate in other markets. So what is that? Is that open banking? Is it access to, you know, solutions like uh, the, 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 the foster rail? Like what, what is it that's going to tip us in the direction of being a more innovative economy uh, that, that the, the Canadian Lenders Association represents? Yeah, so maybe putting my crystal ball in. Um, I, I think there's a few factors, right? There's, there's certainly government, there's, there's the regulatory oversight and the regulatory mandate of Payments Canada to expand participation. So, so that ultimately is going to drive additional competition. I think that that helps FinTech decide that Canada is a market that's a, a market in which I could actually operate a profitable business. I think that's, that's one. I think the other piece, if I was to just, you, you know, from, from reading the tea leaves, I guess, as you put it, Canadian banks are starting to realize that to be competitive in the market, they need to look at partnerships. I mean, we just heard RBC, I think this week, announced their partnership with Plaid in order to provide you know, API-based access into RBC data in order for FinTech 
both for fintech to access data that's at RBC and, and RBC to access data that, that Plaid may have that, that's valuable to them. So I think you're starting to see this movement where the Canadian banks are looking more at partnerships, recognizing that they need to provide value to the consumer that they otherwise can't provide on their own or meet the mm -hmm. demand and the speed on their own. And so I think if you take those two notions together and then you compile it with the fact that a lot of fintech are very, very successful in, in the US, very, very successful in the UK, they're now at the point where they're thinking growth, where's the next market where I can get growth? And Canada becomes very attractive for those operating in the US because if they can operate in the US, they likely have a similar client base in Canada. So when you take all of that mix together, Canada starts to look very attractive mm -hmm. over the coming years. And so like, I couldn't be more excited. I mean, I think, of, I think of the things like my son bugs me about when it comes to finances. Like I'm just hoping that we can deliver solutions that actually meets his needs and he's 12. Right. Right. <laughs> and so, so, but, but his expectations are way higher than mine because I'm used to the dial up internet. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And, and so, so before I just move to, uh, to you to final uh, thoughts, uh, Chris, um, uh, just I, I want to, you know, to, to uh, double click on that. You know, we at the CLA couldn't agree more. Uh, we have members such as RBC and BMO who are at the table innovating with every other stakeholder. It's all about breaking down those um, that that um, uh, the, the the historic bifurcation of incumbent versus uh, innovator or incumbent versus alternative. We don't believe in that. We believe there's continuity in in innovation and that there's as much innovation happening on one side of the pendulum as the other. It's all to do with partnerships. And so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Chris, uh, tea leaves, um, uh, a lot has been said, but in conclusion, yep. Uh, where are we going? Well, I, I like how you worded, you know, blockchain as opposed to cryptocurrencies. I think a lot of people think they're one and the same, but they're not. But, you know, where we're going, we're going to continue seeing adoptions and we're going to continue seeing growth in, in real time payments. Uh, I think blockchain is going to be a from a technology perspective. It's going to be something that is going to come into our into our financial services world. Um, probably more from a stable coin than a traditional crypto, right? If you think about it right now, last I checked, there were 4,000, 5,000 plus different cryptocurrencies. Uh, can you imagine if you're a, you're a lender trying to support 4,000 plus different types of cryptocurrencies you're going to pay out? But nonetheless, I think the technology that is built on and that distributed ledger concept bodes very well to partner with the real-time speed and convenience that we're seeing. So I think we're going to start seeing um, technology adopt blockchain and uh, distributed and undistributed ledgers in a way that are actually going to help us speed up what we dub as real-time payments. So I, I'm excited about that and what those opportunities may hold. You know, I think there's great, great benefits in, in a network like that. It's just who's going to be the first out there in the greenfield opportunities to present that use case. And as you said, you know, in that ecosystem of, You've got the government regulators, you've got the, the, the financials, you've got the fintechs, and you've got this techno technology layer about it that, again, it can be as far left and right as some of the approaches are in solving customer needs. When all that comes together, we're really going to begin seeing things take off. And I think the adoption is going to be really fast when we see those technologies. So, Gary, I think you're on mute real quick. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, nearly, I nearly lost the hour without going on mute. Um, uh, I, uh, a great way to end. And, and um, I, I also wanted to share this with the group, which is our uh, you know, crypto roundtable, where we're looking at you know, crypto uh, back lending, touching on innovation in that sector as well. Listen, thank you so much. That was an amazing hour. Um, I think we learned a lot. I certainly did. And, uh, and thank you for being members of the CLA and, and supporting the industry with, uh, you know, all the thought leadership that you do. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Danielle. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Quickly, just uh, wanted to thank you, of course, to uh, Jim and Chris. Obviously, we covered a lot in the hour. I feel like we could go on for another hour. Um, but of course, thank you so much for all your great insight and to you, Gary, for moderating the discussion. As Gary said, we encourage everyone to become a member of the CLA and participate in the fintech lending community. 
And of course, to uh, continue attending our events, we have lots coming up. So you can find them at lendersevents.com. And as I said earlier, we're gonna um, email everyone the recording of the session so you can watch it again in case you missed anything. But thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.